the board. I, I don't correspond, uh, you know, as far as what we're going to teach. We don't coordinate, I should say. We just be, we're just led by the Spirit. Whatever people want to teach on is up to them and the Lord. And uh, and so uh, James asked, well, what's the title of your message? Well, I said, Authority of the Believer. And he says, that's what she's teaching on. <laughs> I said, well, praise the Lord. And uh, God is uh, getting a message to us that we have authority. Amen. That's why I sang that song just then. God has given me power and authority. Because we have authority as believers. Praise the Lord. How many of you are believers? All right, good. Praise God. That means you have authority. So we're going to study today, this morning, how to, what that authority is and how to exercise it. Flo's already shared some on it, and she says she's going to continue on it for the next five years, so that's <laughs> fine. You're, you're going to get a good dose of it. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word this morning. Father, we thank you that you guide us, instruct us, teach us, uh, give to us revelation knowledge by the mighty Holy Ghost through the word. And we thank you, Father God, that we put that into practice, for we're doers of your word and not hearers only. And this morning, Lord, we thank you for that revelation knowledge in advance. We thank you, Father God, that you keep us from the evil one. We thank you, Father God, that we put our hand to the plow and we don't look back. We thank you, Father God, that you've made us the head and not the tail, and above and not beneath. We thank you, Father God, for those things you've entrusted to us to do and to perform on planet Earth until you return. And Father, it's our desire that we might learn from your word how we're to do it, proper instruction, that we might carry out your will on Earth on your behalf, in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right. Hallelujah. Well, we're going to... Uh, we got a lot of scriptures. I don't know how far we'll get. I might be on it five years too, Flo. I don't know. <laughs> Psalm 82. It still goes back to believing. You know, you, none of this works if you don't believe. Right? So I haven't gotten off of believing because my title is Authority of the Believer. And... Uh, uh, because it has to do with believing. You, 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 if you don't believe it, then it won't work. Okay? So you have to believe. And when you believe, oh boy, it unlocks quite a bit. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Psalm 82 says, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. Little g. Okay, now, you know, you might want to you might want to buckle your seatbelt because if you have a religious attitude this morning, you may get offended, and you might, you know, well, we won't go there. But anyway, you just need to listen real good. If you're sleepy, stand up and shake it off because you can't hear half of what I'm saying and get the truth. Okay. Hallelujah. I, I, I pray that I've awakened you here a little bit because I'm very serious. This is no, although it seems funny, it's not a joking matter in the sense that it's life and death. Now, God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. Little g. How long will you judge unjustly? And accept the persons of the wicked. Selah. Verse 3. Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the land of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said, ye are gods. Now swallow. You know, just take a deep breath. <laughs> Hallelujah. Shake off any religious attitude here. I have said, 
ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. Hallelujah. I'm an heir of God and joint heir of Christ Jesus. Yeah. Hallelujah. I'm his, I'm his offspring. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I'm born again from him. Thank you, Lord. Verse 7 says, But you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. What we have a picture of here is God speaking to the believers. Okay? He's saying here, he stands in the congregation of the mighty. That's the church. That's you. Okay? He judges among the gods. Little gods. Little G. You, you, you understand, King of Kings, Lord of little L, Lords. Right? Okay? And he says to us, how long will you judge unjustly? Make wrong decisions. Okay? And accept the person of the wicked. Or accept wickedness in place of righteousness. Verse 3, defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. That's what we're to do. To defend the poor and the fatherless, orphans. To do justice to the afflicted and those who are needy. That's our position. Verse 4. Deliver the poor and needy. Hallelujah. That's, what, that's part of our commission here. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. Why? In the hand of the wicked, they don't care about them. Wicked people only care about themselves. So the wicked people, they'll eat a sandwich in front of somebody starving. Well, sorry you don't have any. Too bad. Right? Hallelujah. Verse 5. They know not, neither will they understand. They don't know and they don't understand. Wicked people don't. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. That's an interesting statement. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. In other words, uh, there's some problems with planet earth. <laughs> in, in case you haven't noticed, there's some issues out there. Hallelujah. Now, some people say, well, don't worry, brother. God is in control. Well, in one sense, he is in control as far as he is the ultimate winner. Right? We are ultimately winners. However, there's a whole lot out there happening that uh, is not the will of God. So if it's not the will of God that it's happening out there, then you can say that the earth is out of course. Part of it. Hallelujah. Here he says, I have said, God is speaking, I have said, ye are gods. Little g. You're not the God. You're not, uh, you know, I met this guy one time, and he thought he was God. I mean, he thought he was really God. This was some years back. I was living at Christian retreat, and uh, he really and truly thought, he was, he was obviously off his rocker, but uh, he really and truly thought he was God. I'm not, I'm not saying that. Please don't leave out of here thinking that I'm anywhere close to saying that. But I am saying under God Almighty, he has in, in, entrusted you, empowered you with such authority that he calls you little gods. Well, think about Adam. We, we learned this last night. For those of you who missed the marriage class last night, you missed a blessing. Flo and James are quite comical. And the word is good, too. <laughs> but, you know, even if you're happily married, I tell you what, you can always use the word of God to, to your marriage. It's a good thing. So anyway, I encourage you to come next Saturday. If you miss this one, it's all right. He's going to give a syllabus so you can make it up. But it's just good. But in it, well, last night we, we were talking about that Adam named all the animals. He had the authority and the wisdom to name the animals on the earth. That's a lot of naming. What about when he got to the end? How do you remember what you named the first one? Right? 
I mean, that's a lot of animals. So, he created man with the authority and the power to be an under ruler on the earth under him. Right? Would you agree with that? So it says here, I have said, God has said, you are gods. And all of you are children of the Most High. All of you are born again, servants of the Most High, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Verse 7, though, says, but you'll die like men. And fall like one of the princes. Why? Because the context of Psalm 82, is, there's some correction there. He's talking in, in the congregation of the under rulers, the little gods, and judging among them. But, and he's saying, you've erred. And so he said, when you err, here's the results of it. You'll die like men die. Well, we see it all the time. Hospitals full of them. Believers that are dying of the world's diseases. Hello? You don't have to. You don't have to. But you see what happens is when we get a little bit of incorrect teaching, misunderstanding of the word, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And then we end up dying like men die. I got news for you. We're not going to in this congregation. Praise the Lord. When it's time for us to go, he'll just take our breath away. We'll just graduate. Praise the Lord. We're, 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 we're not going to have any of this suffering in the hospital for months and years. We're not going to be hooked up to a bunch of tubes. We're not going to be a vegetable state for a while. We're not going to die like the world dies. Why? Because we're not going to allow our judgment to be off. We're going to judge according to the Word of God. We're going to believe the Word and do it. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. But he says here, verse 7, You'll die like men and fall like one of the princes. Hallelujah. New English Bible, I like that translation. I didn't bring it. I just looked it up online. And... Uh, but I jotted it down. It says verse 7 there, like men you shall die, which sets it a little bit uh, bolder there. In other words, like regular man, like man that doesn't know God, that like man that's not immune to the diseases of the world, Exodus 15, 26. That's how people are dying. They're not supposed to die that way. And it says you'll fall like any prince. Well, princes fall. They exalt themselves with pride and various other things, and, and they end up falling. Well, hallelujah. Not us. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. He says, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. Well, when the Lord returns, shall he find faith on planet earth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, I believe he will. Amen? Will he find it in us? I believe he will. Praise be to God. You don't have to die like the world dies. You don't have to have cancer. You don't have to have tuberculosis. You don't have to have AIDS. You don't have to have arthritis. You don't have to have uh, Alzheimer's. You don't have to have any of those things. That's the world's. They're not ours. Glory to God. Well, look in John 10. Jesus himself brought this over to the New Testament, just so you won't think I'm too far off base. Hallelujah. I tell you, I love the Word of God. John chapter 10, beginning with verse 30. I and my Father are one. Jesus said that. I and my Father are one. Now, because he said that, the religious people took up stones to stone him. Verse 31. <laughs> they said, whoa, who is this guy saying he's one with God? Verse 32, Jesus.
Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those do you stone me? Now, you know, it's pretty amazing to me that he wasn't afraid. If, if he knew who he was, you understand. But you don't understand, if somebody picks up stones to throw at you, what's your first reaction? Run or dodge them. Hide behind something. But it doesn't indicate here that he did any of that. It indicates that he stood up to them, in fact, and said to them, I've showed you many good works. Which one are you throwing that stone at me for? <laughs> wow. Well, you see, because... Jesus knew his authority. Hallelujah. Verse 33, the Jews answered him saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou being a man, make us thyself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said, ye are gods. Interesting. Now that's the master quoting Psalm 82, verse 6. <laughs> now, you have to understand here that he's saying you have authority. You have been endowed with authority. Hallelujah. Hallelujah by the creator that created all things. Verse 35, If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. That means you are little gods. The scripture cannot be broken. Well, I'm telling you, you're not going to hear this on just every church in town. I can tell you that right now. I don't know how many messages you're going to hear about this, but uh, it, it's, not, it's not the typical message. However, it's, it's the Lord's words. So why shouldn't we preach it? Well, because of fear. One thing, people are afraid. Well, what would the people think if I start saying that stuff? You better start saying it. You better start saying what God said about you. You better start taking that authority and using it because otherwise you're going to die like men. You're going to fall like princes. That's what the scripture said. And then you're going to wonder why, God, I don't understand. Verse 35, if he call them gods unto whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, verse 36, say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemous, because I said I am the Son of God, you know, there. I, I don't go in the prisons right now. I used to go in the prisons on a regular basis. And uh, in Orlando, at the main prison down there, Central Florida Reception Center, it sounds like a hotel, but it's not. It's where they send the prisoners in before they farm them out in this area of Florida. And some of the prisoners that would come to my Bible study, they were being coaxed by a group called The Way. You ever heard of that? The way? Well, they're a cult. They teach that Jesus is not the Son of God. And he said to me, because they taught him this, Jesus never said, I am the Son of God. Well, he's never read John 8, 36, 10, 36. Because he says right here, I am the Son of God, amongst other places. But you see how they twist scriptures to try to keep people in bondage. Hallelujah. So anyway, I shared with him and uh, he continued to come. Hallelujah. Verse 37. If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though you believe me not, believe not me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. The key is you got to believe. He's emphasizing over and over, you got to believe. If your mind explains it away, you're in trouble. You're going to have a problem. You've got to believe. Look in Mark 13. Mark 13. Praise the Lord. They get him in verse 32. 
But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take ye heed, watch, and pray, for you know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. He gave what to his servants? Authority. Authority. Now let, let, let's read that again. First he's saying, take heed, watch and pray. Okay? Verse 34, for the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. The Son of Man took a far journey. He went back to heaven, didn't he? He left his house. That's planet Earth. Hallelujah. Where we are. He's the creator. But he gave authority to those here, his servants. And to every man a job. Hello? Every man a job. You say, but you're the preacher. You're supposed to do the work of God. No, 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 no. Now, I am supposed to do it, but you are too. You have a position. You have a job. You have a calling. Unique. That God has called you to do. You know why most people fall into depression and into uh, turmoil and to uh, problems? Because they pursue selfish motives instead of God's calling. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So the Son of Man is a man. He took a far journey. He left his house. He gave authority to you and I. And to each one of us, our own individual job. And commanded us to watch. Hmm. Interesting. He gave us authority. Say, I have authority. I, have authority. I, believe, I have authority. I believe I have authority. So I act like I have authority. So I act like I have authority. Because believing is an action, isn't it? Okay. Watch ye therefore, verse 35, for you know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning. Lest coming suddenly he finds you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say to the church in the year 2010, to all, watch. Wake up. Make sure you're not sleeping. Well, how can I be sleeping? Well, if I'm, it would be various ways. One way I'm lulled to sleep because I'm not doing the job assigned to me. Some people don't even know the job assigned to them. You know, they've never asked God what that job was. They just go about their own thing, doing their own life. They got saved, but they just never really went on in and said, Okay, Lord, here I am. What am I to do? <laughs> and the other set of people, they get saved. And they, they, they feel the call of God, but they do their own thing. Maybe, they, maybe they're called to be an evangelist, but they want a pastor because they think maybe pastoring is easy or there's more money in it or whatever. Maybe they're called to do the mission work. They don't want to go to the mission work. It's too hard over there. So they stay here. So they fall asleep. Maybe, you know, Luke the 8th chapter talks about the sower sows the word or the seed. And then things happen to him. Well, that, you know, along the way, things happen. And various things and put you to sleep. And he's warning us here. You don't know when he's coming back. I wouldn't want to be asleep when he comes back. So what do I do? I've got to be sure that I'm taking the authority that he's given me and doing the job he's told me to do. Now, just think about it. If any one of us today were asked to manage a particular function at a business then we would prepare we'd study we'd apply ourselves we'd concentrate on it and then we'd do it right because there'd be financial reward from it correct 
I've got a promotion. I'm a manager. I have some authority. Now I'm the CEO, whatever you want to be called. Right? And what, in, what is in that? The reason people aspire to those levels is because there's more money. There's physical reward. Well, here God has given you spiritual reward, and that's the, the very uh, basis of all the physical. And so how much more are we to pursue that calling and that job and the authority he's invested in us to do that job above everything else? Well, if you don't believe this, then you won't do it. You just say, ah, I got to get to work. I got to go do this, got to do that. Look in Luke. You can probably quote it. But I'll, instead of quoting it and paraphrasing it, I'll read it to you. Luke 10, 19 says, Behold, Luke 10, 19, Behold, behold, wake up, behold, take note, look at this. I, Jesus, give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all, say all, all, all the power of the enemy. And nothing, no thing, shall by any means hurt you. That's good news. That's authority. That's authority. It's interesting because I see as I minister to folks that I, I see that most are, not necessarily most, but many are, Many are saying, asking God for things that they need to be using their authority to command. Now, if you were, again, back to the job analogy, if you were assigned a management position and you still have another manager over you and you're given that position because of your talent and your skill and you'd go about doing that position, but if you had to continually go running and ask him every step I don't think you'd keep it very long the reason you got that management position was because you could make a decision you could do some things that you didn't have to bother the next guy because he's up there doing his thing oversight now you might have to every once in a while but you have some authority some knowledge some skill and so you're not continually running well, here, God has set it up in a similar fashion in that he has given you authority through the word. He's given you knowledge through the word. He's given you the power of the Holy Spirit. And now it is our job to take that and use it. Instead of asking God to do some things. Now, please understand, there's a time to ask God for things. I'm emphasizing the authority of the believer this morning. There is uh, a time that you have to just take that authority and bind and loose and command. And I think it's much more often than what's being done in the church today. And I think that's why a lot of people are sick, hurting, broke, busted, and disgusted. Right? Well, I don't know whether y'all believe me or not. Exodus 14. You're kind of looking at me like, what? Exodus 14. Praise the Lord. You got to love me anyway, don't you? Praise God. Exodus 14, here with uh, Moses and the children of Israel. Let's see where I want to start. Maybe verse 10. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes. I'm in Exodus 14, 10. And behold, the Egyptians, and, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were sore afraid. The children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. Okay? Now you would think that would be all right to cry out to God. You're in a dilemma. You're in a problem. The world is coming in on you like a flood. That's what he says here. Egypt's the type of the world. 
was coming in, the pressures of life, the circumstances of life are bearing down on you very, very difficult, very hard. And you're feeling the pressure. And they were so afraid. We said Jesus stood in the midst of them with stones after him. He was not afraid, and he's our example. And they cried out unto the Lord. That seems right in appearance. But now listen. Verse 11. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? <laughs> Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Verse 12. Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. How many times the devil told you that when you're standing in faith? And the devil say to you, Why don't you just, uh, you know, go to another church where they don't pressure you like that? Well, it's not the church pressuring you, by the way. Or maybe when you're standing believing that you're healed and the, the, the symptoms are on you and the devil said to you, oh, just go ahead and give up. You know, Go ahead and go to the doctor and take the medicine, do whatever. And you had committed to stand. Or how about when the rent or the mortgage is on you and, and you're standing there and you don't see any results. The enemy says, see, you're going down this time. They're going to foreclose on you. He's a liar. Glory to God. Then that, that, that little voice comes to you and says, See, you, you need to do so and so. Just go back to the way you were. But that's very real because I have people counsel with me and they say to me, I can't do this anymore. It's too hard to walk, it's too hard to believe. I have people say those words. Well, here, that's the root of it, right? It's Satan. The pressure is on them, trying to make them give up. <laughs> Moses, verse 13, said to the people, Fear you not, stand still, see the salvation of the Lord, which he'll show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you'll hold your peace. Verse 15. Now look at verse 15. Don't you see it in your Bible. The Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? God speaking. <laughs> Speak to the children of Israel that they go forward. Well, this is what? This is a picture of the religious believer today. Me included. We're crying to God. We look sincere. We seem sincere. We smell sincere. We appear to the world and the church very sincere. But it does not get the job done. So what good is it? We're saying, Lord, go get them. And he's saying to you, you go get them. Hello? Verse 15, the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying to me? Well, you are God. May I remind you? Well, of course, being facetious. But what God is saying to you is, yes, I am. Read my word. Haven't I said, ye are God's, little g. You have authority. You have power. You have the right to do certain things. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You have a job to do. And it includes certain things. Praise God. I hope you're getting this. So the next time you, you listen to yourself pray, there are things you need to ask God for. Okay? Please hear me clearly. But there are other things within the realm of your authority that you need to take care of by faith commands, binding and loosing. 
telling the devil where he belongs. Hello? Because Jesus has already defeated Satan for you. He's done his part. Now you must do yours. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Praise God. Glory to God. The, Bible, uh, the uh, dictionary defines authority as the right to control, command, or determine. I like that. Man was given authority on earth, the right to control, command, and determine, determine right from wrong. Satan took it from Adam, from Eve. You know the story. Good news, Jesus bought it back. Hallelujah. Psalm 115, verse 16, you can turn that if you want, but you don't have to. It says, earth was given to the children of men. That's us. Earth was given to us. If you have to consider, Brother Hagin once gave a testimony. It's in his books and teachings. I'm not sure which one. He gave a testimony about the example of a policeman directing traffic. You probably read it. If you read much of Hagin, I'm sure you would have found it. But anyway, for those of you who haven't, a policeman goes, stands out in the middle of the highway in his uniform, okay? And he puts up his hand, and even the Mack trucks stop for him, right? It's not the size of the man. It's not the looks of the man. It's the authority of whose he is. He's a policeman invested with certain authority, and you better stop. Hallelujah. Now you are dressed in the armor of God. Hallelujah. You got your uniform on. And when you say stop to the devil, he has to stop. Okay? Because that's part of the authority invested in you. That's your job, by the way. It's your calling. These signs will follow believers. They will cast out devils. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Maybe you say, well, I don't, I don't know if I want to meet a devil. Well, if you're a believer, you're going to run across them. And you better know how to get rid of them. And you don't sit there praying for God to, to deliver them. You don't sit there and say, Lord, please, I love my brother and my sister. Please take the devil off of him. Because God's going to turn around and say to you, Moses, you speak. Command it. Command it. Hallelujah. Y'all still out there? Glory. Look at Matthew 16. Matthew 16. Praise the Lord. It's exciting to study the Word of God, isn't it? It also makes you accountable, though, because what you hear taught, truth-wise, you need to put into practice. Matthew 16, verse 19 says, And I will give unto you, thee, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That's authority, isn't it? Keys represent authority. Is that correct? If I have the keys to the car, I have the authority to drive it. Now, that's in most cases. But like if you walk into the dealership, well, the dealership has lots of keys on the keyboard. But if you're not given by proper procedure the right key to the right car, then the police, that one in the uniform, is going to be chasing you when you try to drive one off. Right? Because you didn't have the authority to do it. Keys represent authority. If you have keys to the building, to the facility, your house, for instance, you have the authority to enter in. It's your house. But generally, everybody on the block doesn't have keys to your house. 
So they have no business in it. Right? Okay, so keys represent authority. Now here he said, verse 19, I will give you the keys of what? The kingdom. <laughs> the kingdom. Wow. Glory. But let's go a little deeper on this. He's also here, because of the context used in, where uh, Jesus asked, who do you say I am? You know, a lot of people say, what, just start back at 13. When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Well, some say you're Baptist, some say you're Catholic, you know. I mean, really, that's the same kind of thing. It's what he's asking here. So they, wanted, uh, they know him as their denomination. They don't know him. They know him as their denomination. Okay? He said, well, who, who's the, who do they say I am? Verse 14, they said, well, some of you say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Here in today's world, we'd say, well, you know, you're Baptist or Catholic or whatever. But he said to them, but whom... Do you say I am? That's what's important. Not what everybody else is saying about me. Who do you say I am individually? Who am I to you? Simon Peter answered and said, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said, You're blessed. For flesh and blood, wisdom, man's wisdom, man's intelligence, the doctorates behind your name didn't reveal this to you. But Father, God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. It came by revelation of the spirit in your spirit. Bypassed your mind. It's called a, we call it revelation knowledge. You see, until we got saved, we didn't know what that was. It, it didn't exist to us because we didn't believe in it, number one. And we didn't believe in a spirit world, so... Maybe we believed in a devil spirit world, but we didn't believe in God as a spirit world. And so, uh, we didn't understand Revelation, but now we do, because we got born again. Our eyes, spiritually speaking, have been opened. Hallelujah. And so, he says to him, flesh and blood didn't reveal it to you, but Father did. And I say to you, Peter, that upon this rock I'll build my church. That's us, the church. Now, unfortunately, some denominations have taken that to think Peter was the rock. But he was not the rock. The revelation was the rock. The revelation of who Jesus is. Okay? Upon this revelation, I'll build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now listen... Hell cannot win in this case. Why? It's been stripped of its authority. And the authority has been given to the believer. Hallelujah. So in, in, in this context, the keys given to you are symbolic of the revelation that you receive to unlock the riches of the kingdom of heaven. Glory to God. Right? Well, I don't know about you, but I got way too many keys. So, you see, if key is authority, it is. That means I have authority for these different functions. But each key unlocks a separate function. I got one for the store. I got one for the church. I got one for the office back here in the church. So I got many keys here. So, here it says he's given us the keys, plural. Mm -hmm. Glory to God. Of the kingdom of heaven. Why? It's multifaceted. Oh, praise the Lord. But it's only multifaceted, and I only have the authority and the keys to what I have revelation of. If I'm still thinking with my natural mind, I got nothing. It's got to come from here. That coming from here is going to be by me knowing him, by me studying, meditating, praying, and doing what I read. Making an effort. Fulfilling the call. Doing the job. 
We used to have this when I worked at Boast. We used to have this controller there, comptroller, the accountant. Nice man. He was a Jewish man. And he would come in early in the morning. He left every day about five. But he had to drive two hours. He drove from Lakeland in. I guess about an hour, hour and a half. And uh, every day, because of his position as a manager, he had, like you've seen these travel things on wheels, when you go to the airport, you take it so you don't, when you're walking down the airport, you don't have to hold it so far. Well, he had that full of his work every day he took home. So uh, aside from the eight hours on the job, the hour and a half driving, the hour and a half leaving to get home, he had a suitcase full of work that he did because he was a good manager. He took his job serious. I wish I could get Christians that committed. Hallelujah. I know there's no immediate financial gain. In other words, when you, you have uh, exercised uh, uh, your right, your authority to come to church and to study and hear the word. And then when you walk out the door, generally speaking, somebody doesn't hand you a hundred dollars for doing it. It'd be wonderful if they did, but they don't, usually. I have had, I have had people say, well, the Lord told me to bless you with this, so that's fine too. I've had God put gas in my tank, my car, when I come to church. I've had those things happen. They're not the norm. Generally, just come out of commitment. However, when I go to work on Friday, I expect a check. Right? If they don't give me that check on Friday, I may give it one more week, but I'm probably not going to give it much more than that. And so, what I'm saying is that you have to do this by faith. And as you exercise your faith, faith to believe and pursue this more than you do in the natural the natural will get in line and come hallelujah but you got to believe that enough first to do it because the enemy's sitting on your shoulder telling you yeah, don't waste your time we have the keys we can unlock all of heaven's riches and we have authority to use it Resources to do what God's called us to do. Hallelujah. Look at Luke 9. Luke 9. Chapter 9, verse 1. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over some of the devils. All the devils. I just want to be sure y'all wait. And what else did he give him authority to do? Cure diseases. Wow. Wow. That means you and I have power and authority, keys, to get rid of devils and to heal people. Hello. Now, I'm not the healer. You're not the healer. But God in us, by the authority is invested in us, will and does heal people for the glory of God. Hallelujah. M Matthew 8. Matthew 8. I'm trying to hurry. <laughs> Matthew 8. Verse 5, when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lies at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. Jesus said to him, I'll come and heal him. No hesitation, no question. Did you go to church? Did you give your tithes? Did you sow a seed? You know all the stuff that popular teaching out there today. He didn't say none of that. He just said, this is one of my people on earth that I love. I'll come and heal him. Verse 8, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word only. 
my servant will be healed. Now note what he said to do. He told the Lord, just say it. Give the command. Speak the word of faith. And then he explains himself. Verse 9, I'm a man under authority. I understand authority. Having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, go, and he goes. Then another come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard that, he marveled and said to them that followed, Truly I say to you, I have not found so great a faith, no, not in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom, they'll be cast out in outer darkness. They'll die like men, they'll fall like princes. They'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hallelujah. I will come and heal him. No, no, that's all right, Lord. I understand authority. Just give the command. It'll work. Hallelujah. Woo, glory to God. You got to note here that, that we use this authority. We rule and reign on earth through our words. Right? Mark eleven twenty three. 23. We say to the mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea. We doubt not in our heart, but we believe that those things which we say shall come to pass. We shall have those things we say. Right? Titus. Look at Titus. This is done by speaking. Hallelujah. Praise God. Titus chapter 2, verse 15. These things speak. Hello. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Okay? So how do we use our authority? Speak. Say the word. Give the faith command. Hallelujah. Mark 1, I, I just want to drive this home a minute. Mark 1. I told you I had a lot of scriptures. Mark 1, verse 27. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he, Jesus, even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. How does he control the un, uh, unclean spirits? Speaks. Speaks, commands. Through his authority. You've been given that authority. We read that. Do you know that that is actually the finger of God? That's an interesting thought. God has fingers, you know. Can't you, I mean, isn't it so exciting that one day we're going to stand face to face? Praise God. My physical body just won't handle that. That's why people fall out. Now, some people fall out because everybody else is falling out, but some people really fall out. Right? I used to when we first, I said, well, don't put no catchers back there because, you know, if it's really God, just let them fall. But then I started changing my mind because I found out some people don't fall because it's really God. And they hurt themselves. And they bonked the chair. And the floor sounds like a bowling ball hitting. <laughs> so he said, we better put catchers back there. Because <laughs> we can't really tell which one is really falling from God and which one is not. They're all falling, so that's fine. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Glory to God. All right. So we see here. That it's the finger of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, look in Luke 11. Yeah, and we're awfully tight in here too. To uh, be fallen so much. Uh, you know, that's where we got the name Holy Roller from. Because people fall out. And, you know, if you've ever been to some of the real Pentecostal meetings, when they are doing... Uh, you know, jerking and chucking and jiving. 
then they roll up and down the aisles and so they do it's fine I, I used to have somewhat of a problem with it but it's fine I'm just glad people are getting blessed I'd rather be doing that than in the hospital sick hallelujah but I used to try I told y'all Jamaica story I'd try to cast the devil out of them so we won't go there this morning praise God Luke 11 I could tell you some stories I don't know I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> Luke 11 oh, Luke, we better stay with the word Luke 11 <laughs> praise God you can ask Mama Jen and, and Walter they can tell you some stories about me Luke 11, verse 20 says, But if I, with the finger of God, cast out devils, Jesus is speaking, no doubt the kingdom of God is coming to you. Now look at that. Jesus says, If I, with the finger of God, cast out devils. Now think about it. How does he cast out devils? Words. He don't punch the people trying to get the devil out. He don't trip them. He don't shake them. Contrary to some Pentecostal churches. Come out! Well, their teeth fly out and their wig falls off, but the devil's still there. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Jesus spoke. And when he spoke, the demons had to obey. He cast out demons, and the, the, the scriptures, Jesus said it himself, if I do this, hallelujah, with the finger of God. It's interesting. Think about it. I'm explaining why in a second. Exodus 8. Exodus 8, verse 16. Let's look at that. Exodus 8, verse 16. The Lord said to Moses, Say unto Aaron, Say, say. Say, say unto Aaron, Stretch out your rod and smite the dust of the land, that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And they did so. Aaron stretched out his hand. He obeyed the word. The rod smote the dust, became lice. Verse 18. The magicians did so with their enchantment to bring forth lice, but they couldn't do it. So there was lice upon man and beast. Verse 19, then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, the word of the Lord said, do this. Aaron did it. Results happened. The magicians tried to do it. It didn't happen. Well, they said, well, this is truly the finger of God. It had to do with speaking. Okay? He didn't just stand there and look at it and go, hmm. You know, mental telepathy. Oh. He spoke. Aaron did. And it happened. Okay? So, same thing with the, with the, uh, the Ten Commandments. Written with what? God's finger. Hallelujah. So, God's finger wrote the Ten Commandments. The Word of God. Well, you know what? He'd been communing with Moses, I bet. He spoke them, and when he spoke them, that power wrote them, implanted them, if you please. The reason I say that is this. What does that mean, the finger of God? What does that, what does that have to do with anything? Well, because what happens when the finger of God touches him? He feels it, right? You touch with God that way. God's finger literally touches you. Oh, hallelujah. I don't know if you're getting this or not. How? When I give the faith command and set somebody free, God, by his finger, touched them. 
<laughs> Glory. Now when you get this, you'll shout. Because this is our job. This is our position. This is our commission. To stand up, be men and women of God, take the authority God has given to us, take the keys out of our pocket and use them to touch people. Hallelujah. Woo, glory. With the finger of God. How do I do it? Come out in the name of Jesus. I bind you, foul demon. Pain, you leave my body in Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah. Want to be touched by God? Start walking in his authority he gave you. The finger of God. <laughs> Glory. It's exciting. I'm telling you. Woo, hallelujah. We use our authority in prayer. We use them over circumstances. And we use them over the devil. But listen to me and listen real good. We never use authority, God's authority, over people. I can't command you to do something and expect it to be done. That's witchcraft. I just need to throw that in there. If you're at home commanding your wife to do something, she's probably going to pop you. It don't work. Or vice versa. <laughs> Hallelujah. Your authority is according to what God instructs you. And your position, although a vast, according to man's knowledge, still limited position. We don't command men or women. We command the devil. We command circumstances. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Two more scriptures and I'll let you go. Proverbs 29. One of those scriptures is a book, though. But we won't mention that. No, I'm just kidding. Proverbs 29. That's why we had to keep the uh, sandwiches in the cooler. Somebody's got a long-winded preacher. Proverbs 29, verse 2. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked bears rule, the people mourn. When the righteous are exercising, using, developing, practicing their God-given authority, it makes us happy. The finger of God is a good thing. Last scripture, I want to leave you with this. Luke 19. Praise the Lord. Luke 19, verse 12. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said to them, Occupy, manage, have authority till I come. But his citizens hated him. That'd be the world. And sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. Well, there are some out there that refuse to walk in these things, aren't there? It's our job to go win them, though. It's not our job just to to say it it's our job to love them enough to give our life to go and get them okay all right verse 15 it came to pass that when he was returned having received the kingdom then he commanded these servants to be called to him to whom he had given the money that he might know how much every man had gained by trading his job his authority then came the first saying lord thy pound hath gained ten pounds that was good and he said to him, Well, thou good and uh, good saver, servant, hello, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over ten cities. The second came 
saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. He said likewise to him, Be thou over five cities. Another came saying, Lord, behold, here's thy pound which I have kept laid up in a napkin. For I feared thee, because thou art an austere man. Thou takest up that thou laidest not down, and reapest that you didn't sow. And he said to him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, you wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taken up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest not thou my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury. And he said to him that stood by, Take from him the pound and give it to him that has ten pounds. Wow. For I say to you that even that er, unto every one which hath shall be given. Now listen, everyone that has will be given. But from him that has not, even what he has will be taken away from him. Interesting. That's also found in Mark 4. It, 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 if you think that you have something, but you're, you're, you're in error, you're going to lose even what you thought you had. You see, the world thinks they're right. They think it's right to kill babies. But even the, what they think they have should be taken away. It'll be given to the ones who are doing something, the ones who are using their authority. Verse 27, those mine enemies which would not that I should reign over them, bring them hither and slay them before me. Lost people. Hallelujah. That's why if you, if you read those words with the, the heart of God and the love of God, it'll almost make you weep because I think it was, I, I don't know what night it was. It was maybe Tuesday night we were in here and we are talking about, I think Bonnie was talking about it and somebody else, that only maybe 2% of the people are saved. And then, but it was also that's it too. Out of a hundred people dying, ninety-eight don't know the Lord. Now. That had, that had better get some keys out rattling in us to get out here and get these people saved. Jesus gave all he had for that person lost, dying, going to hell. How much more I've got to do that to? Now, I can't go down a cross. That's not my authority. It's not my position. But there are things that I can do, and I must find that place and do it. Hallelujah. And it's a victory march all the way. It's victory march all the way. Then I don't die like men die, and I don't fall like princes fall. Glory to God. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for your word this morning. Thank you for these precious, attentive people that are hungering for your word. That sit through this, Lord God, and, uh, and just hunger and thirst after you and absorb this. And Father God, are doers of it. I thank you, Lord Jesus. I thank you, Father God, that it's not the numbers that matter, but it's the effectiveness of those that we reach, Lord. And I thank you, Father, give us hearts for the souls, lost souls. That, Father God, you would make it revelation knowledge to us how we can fulfill with our talent your job, the, that position that you've given to us to win more. If we have ten talents, we, we win ten more. Or we double it in our lifetime, Father. Triple it, quadruple it, whatever you called us to do, Lord. In, in the ways that you called us, Lord. And I know there's multifaceted ways. Oh, God. Oh, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. None of our family members are permitted to die before they know you. In the name of Jesus. Satan, 
we bind you up from our family members in the name of Jesus. You'll not kill them prematurely. You'll not make them sick. You'll not break their checkbook and their bank account in the name of Jesus. You'll not take their jobs. And Father, we thank you that revelation knowledge floods their heart. We thank you, Lord, sending laborers, Lord, unto them. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this church, this body of believers, to reach out into this community. Bring in the lost. Mm. Hallelujah. We love you, Lord. Father, we humbly surrender ourselves to you this morning. And, and we say to you, Lord, here am I. Send me. Show me the keys. Show me the position. Show me where I'm to be, what I'm to do, what I'm to say. And I thank you for the courage to use it, to practice it, to do it. Hallelujah. While your heads are bowed, we're still in an attitude of prayer. If you need...